Welcome to the skies over Colorado for November 2021. I'm staff astronomer John Ensworth of the Cherrywood Observatory, volunteer at the Little Thompson Observatory for Longmont Public Media. In the news this month, the most massive white dwarf yet discovered has been studied. It's got a uh, pretty crazy name there. I won't try to read that out, but uh, it is near the limit of what our models say a neutron, a white, I'm getting ahead of myself, a white dwarf can be. If it gets a little bit bigger, it could become a neutron star. Just dump some more stuff. It is also the most compact, just slightly bigger than the moon, our moon. And it's actually smaller uh, than other white dwarfs because of its very high mass. So it's kind of paradoxical, but when they're less massive, they're basically if you think, more fluffy. I don't know if I'd call a teaspoon of material that uh, weighs as much as a mountain uh, fluffy, but it is. It's rotating uh, 6.94 times a minute. Uh, the space station went for a spin for a second time. A Russian thruster fired unexpectedly uh, while they were testing engines of a Soyuz uh, capsule uh, that had been docked there since April. Uh, the station turned by 57 degrees, which is pretty alarming because all the links to Earth uh, through uh, radio communication rely on those antennas lining up. So they keep it uh, really under control most of the time. Um, <coughs> a different Russian module rotated the station 540 degrees uh, back in the summer as about one and a half revolution. So that left it upside down, really bad. So hopefully they uh, can get control of their thrusters. I'm not gonna go into detail on the uh, space 10 year plan. We'll bring some of these out as, as highlights in the future but uh, in three main categories. The Decadal Astronomical Community uh, Plan centers on worlds and suns and context, new messengers and new physics, and cosmic ecosystems. There's a bunch of different things underneath that uh, taking us out many decades into the future. Pretty, pretty cool. Uh, things like the James Webb Space Telescope was planned in an earlier version of this type of advanced thinking. All right, big star parties are fading out for the depth of the winter. I didn't, until making these videos, realize how they really do shut off around Christmas, but um, in December there were no enlisted. There's three there, Georgia, Texas, and um, Mississippi, so kind of getting quiet. November's Astro 101. Is asteroid observing because we're going to send you out to try to find one this time. Uh, when you're looking up from your backyard, an asteroid, they look like stars. They're not moving uh, in that evening with respect to the stars, they just are an additional dim stars. And they're probably better seen in binoculars or a small telescope, but there <coughs> is a possibility of catching one naked eye. The way you know that you actually found it is you go back out a day or two later and see if your star has moved. What I do is I will take a look at the constellation around where I think it is, kind of figure out where I can see this candidate, make like a made-up constellation including it, and then see if that made-up constellation, or asterism would be a better word for it, uh, is broken. If it, one of these stars is out of position from what I remember. You could also sketch it or take a picture of it. Uh, but uh, these asteroids are in an orbit around the Sun, mainly far between Mars and Jupiter. There are some out at Jupiter, there are some that cross Mars and Earth's orbit. Uh, I'm not looking at those. Uh, so these main belt asteroids have an orbital period of about three to six years. Um, because we are going around the Sun once a year, we catch up with each asteroid about every 15 to 18 months. Because we are going faster, we're in an orbit closer to the Sun than these asteroids, we pass them. And just like 
watching a um, semi truck in the right lane go backwards out your car window as you pass on the left we pass these things and they seem to go backwards or retrograde in the sky for about 45 days before and after they are straight out from us in from the sun so up at midnight on the meridian about 50 become brighter than 10th magnitude putting it within reach of a small to medium a telescope so the human eye can see uh, ideally down to about 6 magnitude, 6.5 magnitude. If you're in a very dark location, um, have very good eyes, young eyes, and uh, are experienced observing the sky, you might be able to push it uh, below uh, into the 6.8 area. That's possible. But uh, basically Vesta uh, 5 should be visible. Here's a image. That's not how they look. This is from missions uh, that went out into the asteroid belt, but you can see their relative sizes. Ceres is the biggest, Vesta is the next largest, but Vesta has a brighter surface. Alright, look at the sky above your backyard for this month. We begin the month with a new moon. You should see a beautiful crescent passing Venus in the early part of the month. Half illumination, first quarter. On the 11th, full moon is backed up from the 31st of October last year to the 19th of November now. And the month ends with the third quarter moon in the pre dawn sky. Plants are a great place for viewing just after sunset in the uh, evening is Venus, like I just said, setting almost three hours after sunset. Very bright, brilliant thing. Just can't miss it. Also, after sunset, you have Jupiter and Saturn in the sky. Saturn uh, sets around 10, Jupiter about 11. So Saturn is the slightly dimmer one between bright Jupiter and bright Venus, all over in the western sky. Neptune is high in the southern sky, setting at 1 a.m. Uranus is just rising in the eastern sky in the sunset hours. So just after sunset, here's the glow of the sun going down. I've taken off the atmospheric glow, so you know, this would be kind of bright, uh, having the sun this close to the horizon. But there's Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, and Uranus just rising. On the other side of midnight, all that there is is Neptune and Uranus. Neptune is getting ready to set in the west, and Uranus is kind of high in the western sky. So Neptune and Uranus past the meridian. In the pre-dawn sky, well, Mercury is very close to the sun. You may get a glimpse very early in the month if you happen to be looking into the orangey-yellow twilight glow. Mercury will stand out in that case. Mars is too close to the sun right now to see. So there's Mars way down there. There's Mercury. Mercury is brighter. Uh, in Mars at this point. Mars is beyond the, um, the Sun and the solar system, so it's pretty far away. We will talk about Comet Leonard next month, but there is a comet. Uh, it's very dim right now, but it's going to brighten up as it gets into the inner solar system. So on November 1st, sunrise at 729. By mid-month, it jumps to 644 because we changed to standard time on Sunday the 8th and by the end of the month the sun rises at 7 a.m. sunset way early at 436. The sun sinks from 36 degrees up in the southern uh, sky at local noon down to 29 degrees. I'll say local noon because it's not exactly noon. You have to uh, take into account uh, the earth going faster and slower and it's not quite perfectly circular orbit around the sun. It's called the equation of time if you want to look that up. That would be a good thing to hit in a future month. So a feature object is not really an object, but <coughs> we're going to look at the Leonid meteor shower. You get some meteors visible from November 3rd all the way to the end of the month. 
as a meteorologist, I can also say November 30th is the end of hurricane season, so it's also the end of the Leonid meteor season. Uh, peaks on the 17th, not too far from Thanksgiving. It comes from the Source Comet 55P Temple Tuttle, and it's best right before dawn after the moon sets this month. And you can get pretty good rates, 10 to 15 meteors per hour. Your observing challenge is the asteroid series. Yeah, good with binocular, it will not look like this. It's just going to be a single point of starlight. It might even have a twinkle to it because it is so small. A magnitude 6.7 at its maximum would be a good binocular object. Check back, like I said before, a couple days later to see if that little thing has moved. It's small, 476 kilometers in diameter. And on December 1st, it'll be 1.76 Earth-Sun distances away. So here we are, December 1st at midnight, right at the end of the month. There's Ceres right up here in Taurus. So here's the V of the Hades star cluster, the bright orange star of Aldebaran, which is the fiery red eye of Taurus. And we have one horn up here, one horn over here, the body here, and right above is the little star cluster, the Pleiades, about 410 light years away. So it's in very easy to recognize territory, and it's up high at the end of the month. Midnight. All right, let's take a look at astronomy events in, in the near Longmont. The Longmont Astronomical Society on November 18th, I believe this is just through Zoom, uh, they have Professor Dolores Kipp, Starstruck, Space Weather for Humans and Technology, 7 p.m. I don't see anything on their site saying that they've got their uh, monthly star party planned, so check the site, maybe you can find something I did not. Little Thompson Observatory, public nights are still canceled through the end of the month. Check the websites for things like this video. The Estes Park Memorial Observatory is still operating under small groups and reservations, I'm doing three openings a week. Check out the site for all the details. Northern Colorado Astronomical Society, uh, via oh, some webcast method, Dr. Uh, Joseph, I'd say, Pace, Monsters in the Universe, New Insight into Black Holes. Sorry if I got the last name incorrect, November 7th. This planetarium reopened and has limited capacity and COVID-19 restrictions. The observatory might be closed for the Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, period. I did not see anything there, so maybe they'll pick up when things pick up again in January. And finally, instead of featured software, since I kind of ran through everything that I've used recently, uh, we are covering historical missteps in astronomy in about 30 seconds. This would be the flat Earth, and <clears throat> basically there's a number of ways to take a look at the world around you to see evidence that the Earth is not flat. Um, the Moon is round, as are other planets. You can see them go through phases with curved shadows on them. Ships vanish over the horizon as they go um, downward from your point of view that you would not see on a flat surface. Different constellations are visible in different latitudes. Uh, that would also not be the case. You'd be able to get the entire sky if you uh, weren't, didn't have the body of a round thing behind you as the uh, Earth goes around the sun throughout the year. Uh, you can take a look at shacks, shadows and sticks at noon and reproduce the Aristophanes uh, experiment. Aristophanes, way back in the BCE years, determined the size of the Earth within a percent. And so there are websites where you can use data from high schools using doing this lab and some very simple trig to even figure out the curvature of the earth that way. If you go up in the mountains you can see farther from higher up. That's similar to the ships on the horizon observation. The need for time zones and how they're uh, distributed across the map uh, would only happen on a sphere. Uh, the shape of the earth's shadow on the moon is always round uh, during a lunar eclipse and that 
can happen in any direction of the sky. Uh, as the moon is rising, setting, or high up in the sky, it's always around uh, shadow. Uh, gravity and the focal pendulum can be set up in different locations and a disc would have a different distribution and reaction uh, to the center of mass of a disc versus the center of mass of a sphere. And of course, if you just get high up into the atmosphere on balloons or rockets, you can see the curvature of the Earth it is curved no matter where you take off. If you have any additions or corrections, contact me, johnsworth at gmail.com. This has been the Skies Over Colorado for November 2021. Keep looking up.